real quick do the roll call and introductions and all that. Welcome to everyone, wherever you are, staying cool today. So uh, let's start with um, Washington. I know Evan's there, I see him. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. I'm here. Evan's here from Washington. <laughs> Welcome. Begonia, are you there today? Maybe not yet. Okay. How about Clackamas? This is Chelsea. I'm here from Clackamas. Welcome. Adam's here. Hello. I see it met no there. I saw her. <laughs> okay. I know she's there. Uh, Multnomah. Molly's here. Francis is here. Nina's here. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, Northwest. She might not be here. I think she's actually on vacation this week, lucky girl. How about Mary Polk? Hi there. Lisa's here. Welcome. Lane. Hey, y'all. Beth is here. Hey, Beth. Welcome. Lynn Benton Lincoln. She also, I think, is not here. She has a conflict. So, okay. Not here. I'm, I'm here. Uh, in our yeah. place. Oh. oh, you are here, Matt. That's right. I apologize. Yep. I, knew, Matt. <laughs> I knew you were there for a reason. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, let's see. Yamhill. Here. Welcome. Gulf Coast. Sarah and Charlotte are here. Welcome. Woo! South Central. Billions here. Welcome. Uh, Southern. Hi, Molly's here on behalf of Renee today. Okay, welcome, Molly. Uh, Central. Hey, this is Brenda. Welcome, Frontier. Anna and Patty are here. I saw you with your helper there. Uh, yes. Eastern Oregon. <laughs> Kelly Poe's here. Welcome, Blue Mountain. Aaron's here. Amy's here. Welcome. Welcome. And last but not least, Four Rivers. Hi, Krista. <laughs> Sorry, here. Couldn't get to mute fast enough. My apologies. Welcome. And then from our team, uh, Anne. Hello. Joan. Good afternoon. Kat. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Teresa. Hello. Glad to be here. Welcome, Dana. Good afternoon, Dana's here. Welcome, Andy. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to see you. Welcome. And I think anybody else from ELD that I'm missing? Okay. Anybody else that we didn't call on that's with us today? All right. Super duper. So let me um, pull up the agenda real quick here for us. So we're just going to do um, some quick um, uh, updates. Oh, and I have the agenda from last month, so that's not right. But anyway, I know we're doing some updates <laughs> before we get into coordinated enrollment. And Joan, um, before I hand it over for you for a couple comments, I'll just start. Um, the reason I uh, invited Teresa Waite to join us today. Teresa, you give us one more wave so everybody knows who you are. For those who don't know, Teresa is the one that's um, been helpful with the, with the, does the reports for us and is really our grant manager um, side of the work for me. So a huge, a huge help for both uh, hubs uh, work and coordinated um, enrollment. So um, I just wanted to make an announcement about EGAMS. As you all know, EGAMS is going to do the shutdown that they do um, for a few days at the end of the month. So our request to you, if you want to draw on fund, um, I did a cleanup on EGAMS this week, so we're about caught up with everybody. If you got an email from me, there was a question about something, 
in your claims, um, but otherwise we're fairly cleared um, because everyone's reported through March. If you have any final draws for coordination that you want done by the end of July, you need to submit those to us no later than end of business on Thursday so I can get them done on Friday. And that gives me a little bit of a cushion, but EGOMS will shut down on Friday afternoon. So um, if you have any questions, just get in touch um, with myself and Teresa and we'll um, get you taken care of. But otherwise EGOMS will, it's not closing very long this time. So it should reopen fairly, um, fairly quickly uh, for us to use um, in August. So any questions about that? Good, okay. And I see the, just wanna make sure people are good. The screens are a little bit frozen. Can people hear me okay? And hear you, but yeah. having issues we with- can hear you. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Having, yeah. Now it looks like it's resetting right now. So yeah, we've had, I've been on a couple calls today and GoTo's acting a little bit funny. So hopefully we'll recover okay here. Okay, so, um, Joan, do you want to just give us any updates? I know we don't really know much about the um, about the budget piece, but anything to say there? Um, I think we sent out at the end of last week kind of that uh, we anticipated um, that we would know cuts this week. And then um, yesterday, the cuts list was actually published um, and hubs are included in the list. Um, so uh, we are in the process of uh, trying to understand what our options are related to that. Um, we'll be pulling together some information about the implications of the impacts of the cuts um, and sharing that information, um, making that available to advocates. Um, so we don't know yet whether or not those will actually be the final cuts. Um, as the information said that went out last week, um, there's committee meetings this week, uh, opportunity for public hearings. So um, just wanting to keep people aware of what's going on associated with that. And um, we understand that decisions aren't going to be finally made until August. So it seems like we have opportunity to potentially continue to uh, educate people uh, about that. Um, Brenda, I don't think we know yet what the percent of the original budget this is. We're going to have an internal meeting tomorrow um, with ODE budget and our ELD budget person to talk about where things stand with the hub line item um, and um, whether or not we have any way to offset any of these cuts, for lack of a better way to talk about it. I don't know that we will, but we're going to look at that and see what's possible. So, Great. Thank you, Joan. Um, one other announcement I wanted to make real quick is, as we know, um, Brett Walker is leaving us to go to um, work with Clackamas County. So I know he's will be still involved probably with the, with the hubs and some of the other work as well. So that's exciting. But in the meantime, regarding KPI, um, we I will go ahead and just take over doing the funds release um, and checking the reporting for that. Since that's all condensed to one report, it's just fairly easy. And you can continue to claim um, for KPI as usual and um, any questions about that will come to me. So that no problem there. Um, and with that, if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and move into coordinated enrollment. And if you're ready, I'm ready. Uh, let me go ahead and share screen here. Okay. Think, think you all can see presentation now. Call her out if you can. Um, so uh, Denise and I are finishing up this week uh, all of our individual calls um, with uh, you all on coordinated enrollment. So what I wanted to just do is kind of like reflect back on some of the common questions we heard. Also a couple updates um, since some of us were able to talk that I wanted to make sure um, everyone was aware of um, and just where we're um, where. Uh, we're continuing to to do some work or investigation um, and preparation for um, preschool promise enrollment so our 
first and most um, most frequently asked question. Um, what does spending look like in January? So as you all will remember, we are using preschool development funds um, that are uh, effective until the end of December. Um, and of course, when uh, thinking about um, hiring and any other decisions, a uh, question very obvious came up around um, funding. So um, the, the pretty hot off the presses news is that we've been um, given approval uh, to begin procurement processes to get SSA funds um, out to you with a goal of um, an effective date no later than January. So um, our, our hope is that we're trucking along on that. Um, and yet another shout out to Teresa for <laughs> leading, the, leading the charge in that. Um, our next set of questions is um, particularly in the summer months and uh, vacations and staff training. Um, when will uh, staff be trained? So um, in our efforts to really uh, spend time um, both understanding some of the, the new things coming out through um, ELD and to get uh, training done, really focus on um, those first wave of uh, of um, eligibility determinations for those like conversion families that we've been talking about into preschool promise spaces. Um, we're setting out and I believe Denise will be sending an invite um, for next week to talk about the selection priorities that um, ELD will be creating. Gwen will be helping us lead that um, that conversation um, and really sort of come to an understanding we're asking that this kind of be like a prerequisite to training. Um, we want to make sure that we're clear on um, the understandings of selection and I think how um, how to best be transparent about that as we think about um, explaining and talking with um, families about uh, preschool promise selection. Um, and then um, also just following this, we'll have um, eligibility determination training times. I think we have like nine or 10 options over the week and a half starting uh, Wednesday of next week. Um, and all staff doing eligibility will um, will need to uh, come to one session. I think we're you know open if, if folks want to sign up for more than one, we're going to try to um, try to hold the, the same one uh, as many times as possible, but um, but keep it pretty open in terms of, of how many people per session can be there. Um, we'll be recording sessions, um, and uh, also I think in the sign up as well as um, at the session, we'll be asking you know, what future training would be helpful and how can we support um, staff understanding on different coordinated enrollment um, and preschool promise enrollment processes as we as we move forward on this um, and of course as as new staff come on board I think we'll also be um, uh, recording for that and, and then exploring other options for training or, or individual technical assistance if needed all right the next very uh, frequent set of questions is, is what I've kind of grouped under, um, can I contact the providers in my region um, that have received an intent to award? Um, you know, I, I want to highlight what we've been saying, which is, you know, a provider's executed agreement is the, the green light to start the enrollment work in Preschool Promise, right? We have to have met, um, met those agreements um, before we can move on that. Um, in the interest of uh, getting to know providers, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, reaching out to make introductions um, is, is appropriate during this time. Um, I think learning about the program, um, I, I believe uh, CCRNRs are kind of taking a similar approach to kind of like understand what they know or could know about the, uh, the providers um, specifically. You know, I, I do want to make sure that, you know, prior to training and the manual, you know, um, that any any information you're sharing about what the process will look like um, is fairly high level. Um, I think we don't want to set up a situation in which um, we have, you know, providers with expectations that then look different from the actual practice of enrollment. Um, so really suggest that um, these be just kind of introductions um, and, and getting to know use uh, at this point. Um, and then as agreements are executed, um, so the, the agreements will uh, include uh, the provider's um, 
signing that they are required to participate in coordinated enrollment um, with the hub, so expectations um, there. Um, we'll be working on a process of how we best notify you as soon as um, agreements are executed. Um, and that's because the first steps is really to take a look at any families that may be enrolled um, and paying privately or, um, or through other means um, to uh, determine if they're eligible for preschool promise as, as part of our commitment to continuity uh, and to limiting displacement uh, for families that are eligible for preschool promise and in uh, new preschool promise provider slots. Um, and on the provider note, um, oh, this covered up a little bit. Um, we got a, a, a very bunch of questions, I think, about sort of what the intent to award responses should be, um, how does emergency child care interact. I think um, many of these questions, particularly around intent to award, um, should be directed uh, back to ELD. Um, we, you know, don't want to be in a situation of, um, uh, I guess, having different messages come through and as the agreements are with ELD directly, we kind of need to, to direct them that way. And I think with emergency child care requirements, you know, as as you all know, um, it's an emerging situation that'll, um, that we'll know more about in mid-August, um, but that there's uh, at this time not uh, much more information um, that's available uh, with um, to, to respond to those questions. So just ask to redirect as you can any provider questions that you receive back towards ELD to help um, help make sure that we are capturing those um, through our frequently asked questions and directly uh, with our grants and program team. And my final, um, I think, set of questions is sort of around having a more specific timeline. Um, so we are endeavoring to do that, I think, as we have um, plans or expect to see a rolling execution of agreements come in. Um, some things that we're wanting to keep in mind that um, have, have been raised by you all in our individual calls uh, that we wanna make sure that we're centering and, and continuing to uh, work towards is really making sure that we're centering family choice for any vacancies that remain. That will affect you know, how outreach might occur um, and the timing in which we might fill vacancies after we um, go through the commitment to continuity uh, enrollments. Um, make sure that, you know, I think in the same vein that um, we're trying to maintain an equitable enrollment process for providers who might need more time. Um, as a reminder, up to 90 days is what we're hearing um, for time to execute their contract, but want to make sure that both families are given the full range of options that will be available to them and that also um, that providers uh, who may need more time are, are um, experiencing sort of an equitable enrollment process uh, for their new slots. Um, and then the other piece to keep in mind, I think, is um, you know how we create a timeline around uh, communications on the new enrollment processes. Um, we heard, I think, particularly for providers that were preschool promise and are continuing that um, really kind of um, communications around a change in uh, how things have been done around enrollment uh, is needed. Um, and then uh, more clear expectations about any uh, existing wait lists and the, the families um, that may be on, on those existing wait lists due to um, different understandings of, of uh, providers enrollment process. Um, so we continue to, to work on that as we uh, learn more information. I'm hoping to keep updating and be as specific as possible there, but I think wanting to make sure that we're um, really considering in particular those three bullet points um, as we're, we're moving into an implementation. Um, all right, that was, that was a quick <laughs> word bubble and I can't see the chats, um, but I am sure that there are questions that remain. <laughs> Um, so I could get some read those off again. That would be so great. Okay, we, I know we dealt we dealt with a couple about um, asking about when the contracts are going out, and as we uh, Joan replied, we're still in the appeals process. So that um, I think ends at the end of this week is our meeting, the council meeting, Joan, and then um, and then the execution of contracts will begin after that um, appeals process. Let's ask uh, Dana or Dana or Andy to yeah. to address that. Yeah, this is 
Dana here. Yeah, we're currently working on really just capturing all the information from the appeal. So um, I apologize. I don't have that day on top of We've been working on all the documents and stuff. So more to come on that. Let me go ahead and check on that real quick. Thank you. Um, and then we had a question from Lisa about the procurement process for the um, coordinated enrollment fund. So we're working on that with Teresa um, and our procurement staff right now. Likely what we would like to see happen is that once we get these PDG grants executed, that we can just amend those with the SSA fund. So more to come that, that those funds are for the 16 hubs, so there won't be any um, other process beyond just getting you some kind of grant or contract or amended grant or contract um, for those dollars. And then there's a question about, um, Oh, Beth is asking if we can put up the email addresses where providers send questions at FAQ, how they access that. We can send that um, information out to you as well. And there's what it looks like when they go on there. And then um, also from Beth, it would be helpful to understand what information providers have been given up to this point. Did each of the awardees receive a letter indicating the intent and next step? So Dana or Andy, can you address that question? This is Dana. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. It, the question is, um, have we, what kind of information have we um, given to providers so far to this point who have been awarded? So besides knowing that there's an intent to award, did they get a letter that says that or um, anything that tells them about next steps? Okay, great question. So um, right now, the information that that grantees have received is that initial letter, the intent to award, letting them know about the number of slots and everything, and it's really just directing them to that uh, to that PDF that has all of the tier one, tier two, and tier three. Um, so other than that, there hasn't been any additional like ELD documents. The next step, once we're done with the appeals process, will be that then they will actually go ahead and get the contract um, for those who we intend to award. So um, right now we've been just capturing everything on that ELD, um, you know, on that early learning at state.ors.us, any of the questions, but there hasn't been anything else I formalized, anything like letters or anything like that. Thanks, Dana, and thanks, Andy, for posting that um, link right there. Um, Molly's asking, Molly McLaughlin's asking, can you share the provider point of contact that were included in the RFA so we can do introductions with the new providers in our region? That's probably a Dana question too. Are you, well, are you referring to like the ELD like point of contact or? Molly, can you share a little bit more? Hi there, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, go ahead. Great, yeah, no, I was just hoping to um, get the new, the point of contact that the provider would have included in their RFA so that when we reach out to just say, hello, I'm so-and-so from the hub and just do those uh, initial introductions, we make sure that we're connecting with um, whoever has been the liaison for the process thus far. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, great question. I think as we finalize, you know, the list of, um, you know, right now it's a little bit hard, right? Because everybody's on intent to award, but I think once we have the actual contract executed, then we'll be able to know like, hey, Denise is preschool. Here's the main contact and here's their information. So we'll go ahead and make note of that to go ahead and share that out. So everything's in sync. Thank you. Great, thank so, you. so Dana, that would happen after the Early Learning Council finishes with the, all the appeals, right? That's what you're saying? Correct. Yeah, just that, so that um, I think once we can uh, tell you what the council date is, um, then you'd know. I think it's at the end of this month, though, actually. We can, we'll get that for you. Yes. Um, Hang on, let's see where I'm at here. So, ah, so the question about, good question, Kelly, and I know we've heard this too, Anne, um, does, and I don't know if you can answer this, Dana, the, the 
first letter that was sent, does it call out the need for coordinated enrollment? I hear providers are contacting parents now. So I know that has been a concern for folks. Or is that going to be in the grant? Or when will providers hear that? There's actually a process you have to follow. And I believe that was part of the original RFA, but maybe you speak a little bit to that, Dana and or June. Yeah, this is Dana. Let me turn on my camera here. Hello, everybody. Um, so, so a couple of things on the intent to award letter was very focused on like, yes, the uh, intent to award and the appeal process. As far as like this, you know, what is coordinated enrollment or even for the CCRNRs, um, there's a couple of things going. One is that we're looking to go ahead and ask some questions to the frequently asked question document about coordinated enrollment, about what grantees should do right now um, when it comes to like families and where they should be directing them. The only piece that, you know, just looking at the, you know, past couple of months that we share with providers was really just in our frequently asked questions. We put in there that the hub will be doing some coordinated enrollment uh, the CCRNRs will be providing technical assistance, but we haven't been very, um, very prescriptive about all the different nuances and everything just because of, you know, how everything works. But uh, we're looking to go ahead and add a little bit more information on that FAQ, just providing some guidance on what to do is, is have a, and I know you guys have heard me say this not once, but many times within the past couple of months, it's kind of a, you know, a very difficult process just because everybody's on that intent to award, right? So it's really when the contract gets executed, and that's when um, really uh, everything starts. So we're hopeful by adding these questions to the FAQ, that allows to go ahead and provide a little bit more guidance on that. Uh, Joan, I'm not sure if you want to add anything more to it here. Yeah, the only thing I was going to say is that when providers get um, their agreements from the early learning division for them to review and decide if they're going to sign. The agreement has specific language about coordinating enrollment and the role of the early learning hubs and also the roles and responsibility of working with the CCRNRs related to technical assistance. So, um, and then I believe uh, I don't want to say this for you, Dana, so correct me if I'm wrong, but that the manual itself for Preschool Promise will also touch on both those things. So I, I think um, what's important to understand at this point is that everyone is like, it's all about intent at this point. You know, as soon as we are able to have a signed formal relationship, then people will understand by signing the agreement. Obviously, there will be work to reinforce that. Um, and um, I really would focus on directing people to the FAQs to get this question answered. And it would be really uh, unfortunate for people to continue to establish lists and recruit families since that's really not how this is going to work. So, um, we appreciate any assistance that you can provide in directing people to the frequently asked questions. Yeah, and just uh, thank you, Joan. And just to touch a little bit on that, because um, what the grantee is going to be receiving is they're going to receive their grant agreement, and then um, at the same time, they're going to go ahead and receive their grant manual, their preschool promise grant manual. It talks about the programmatic pieces, the preschool promise requirements, and in it, it's going to go ahead and speak to the collaboration with the CCRNRs and the hubs and really just kind of making in a full full circle there, right? Um, so that we hope to go ahead and have that available. That's going to be available to all of our partners too. Um, but yeah, it's a so there is going to be a company that's going to be available in English and Spanish to that manual, since many of our providers are Spanish speakers too. So come on that. One thing I did wanted to add, which is, has opened up my eyes, you know, within the past, you know, week is I've had conversations with some grantees. Um, that's why we keep going back on the intent to award because some of the grantees are actually waiting to go ahead and see uh, kind of like the revisions for the child care revisions that we're doing because they're also using that as a as a decision making. So one 
stock contract gets sent down, the grantee does have, um, you know, some time to go ahead and decide. Right now we're in this, you know, uh, appeals uh, phase, but that's something for us to go ahead and think about that technically speaking, the grantee um, is still want to go ahead and have some time after we send out the contract, whether they want to go ahead and sign out the contract or not. Obviously, we hope that everybody signs and we're all OK, but that's just something for all of us to go ahead and keep in mind. Yep, yep, yep. So I'll go back and manage some of these questions here. So um, Dana, this this one, too, I would assume that after the council meeting, which you can all see in the chat box, is the 30th. So nine more days, I know we're all chomping at the bit, but nine days till the appeal process goes through them. Um, but a question about sharing a, a specific language that will be included in the provider contracts for hub role and TCR and our role, I'm sure we could can be publicized after those contracts are ready to go to providers, correct? Correct. Yeah, after they've received it, yes, we wouldn't be doing it ahead of them. And I think yeah. it's a little bit complicated by the fact that um, um, I believe that some people on this call are actually potential providers. So just trying to be really cognizant of that conversation. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, so now back to some coordinated enrollment and training questions. Um, so here's a question that I, I think we can address, and um, let me go back and find it here. So the toolkit, does the toolkit with templates come out prior to the training? Will you have access to it prior? Um, and I think that was our intent was to get that out to you so you could set up questions. Is that right, Anne? We're, yeah, we're trying. It's in our final review phase now. So um, aiming to have um, ahead of, of the training or, or at the least by by the first training time, um, but aiming for that Monday before. Perfect. And then um, just a gratitude from Krista about the multiple trainings. By the way, Ann, are we, so I'll send the invitation today for that pre-meeting on the 28th, everybody, and we'll, we will record that just in case um, anybody has a conflict. I know it's just a week away. Will we, we're looking at a way to send out those dates for people to sign up. Is that right, Ann? That's right, I've got a link uh, ready to go. Yay, okay, good, so we'll get those out. And I think an associated question I saw here was, is there um, any limit to the number of folks that people should send to the training? And maybe we should address who should come to the training. Yeah, I think um, who, should have come to, who should come to the trainings are those that will be doing eligibility determination. So if we think about the sort of first steps after provider uh, contracts or, or sorry, agreements are executed, um, those eligible families that may be enrolled or paying privately, those will be sort of our first priority for enrollment. So the training will really focus specifically on, on determining eligibility um, for for that uh, first priority group, um, and uh, and then that that of course will be a part of the uh, enrollment, the coordinated enrollment process ongoing as well. So if you expect um, any any staff that you expect to be talking with families, collecting um, documentation about eligibility, um, or uh, calculating income, uh, things in those categories um, uh, should be uh, attending the training. Super, thank you. How, but and my own question: How long is each training session? Yeah, and are great. they all those nine you offer? Are they all the same? Well, I, I didn't hear the second part of the question. They're two hours, and we have morning and afternoon sessions on most days. Cool. And there's just one two hour. There's not like a part one, part two. That's right. Just one two hour crack at it. <laughs> Super. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then probably a related question to that is, is participation in the pre-meeting on the 28th for directors and coordinators or for everyone involved? Uh, for everyone involved. So this is really our, yeah, selection being um, a, a new piece of information. We wanna make sure that anyone involved um, in the enrollment process is aware of, of what the selection priorities will be for this year. Perfect, thank you. And then um, question about will the training include information on how hubs coordinate with Head Start 
And then I think this is a two-parter, and this may go to Andy and Dana as well. And is it true that Head Start um, Preschool Promise um, providers can start recruitment now? I think the training will touch in some ways, but will not be a main focus on um, uh, on coordinating with Head Starts. The manual does address um, the, some of the Head Start uh, hub coordination elements, so that will be available. Um, and Andy and Dana, I will ask you about rec the recruitment of uh, folks now. You know, I can speak to preschool promise providers, preschool promise providers right now. Um, you know, I think the expectation is um, is that the hubs will be doing recruitment for all preschool promise providers. So I think it really just, you know, adds the layer of collaboration with the OPK. Um, I cannot speak to like the general recruitment of like OPK because they have other programs and all this stuff. So I'll go ahead and, uh, you know, defer to Andy on that. Um, but the expectation will be that through this coordinated enrollment is that our hubs are collaborating with um, with our preschool promise OPK hits our sites. So Andy, I don't know if you want to add anything to the regular the overall world Head Start. Yeah, I can try to. I, I, I mean, it is true that um, this is in in the Head Start world. This is recruitment season, uh, and and that. So yes, Head Start, even those who have Preschool Promise um, funding will be engaging in their calendar of, of recruitment right now, um, although it may look very different this year. And in doing that, they may identify families that um, are eligible for Preschool Promise and perhaps not eligible in, in other ways. Um, so we would just really look and what we are emphasizing with our OPKs is like Dana said, that collaboration with the hubs and building those relationships so that that information can be shared in both directions. Um, we know that our OPKs have their own systems for recruitment and determining eligibility and we don't want to come in and say that they need to change their systems at this point. Um, and so I think that we will find that some OPKs that have also preschool promise funding uh, may already be re within their recruitment identifying preschool promise families to enroll in their program. And we'll just continue to ask that they collaborate with the hubs as we are all um, embarking on this new adventure together. Thank you, Andy. So um, another question, will the trainings address how to handle family questions and or proactively communicate about potential changes to the program school year due to COVID? So I think the question is, is the situation with COVID, how are we, will we address that in the training? Yeah, I think we're gonna have to be in close communication as things emerge about COVID. Uh, so the training is really gonna focus on eligibility determination. Um, we know that things are, are changing and we may have um, more need to either come together and talk about how to talk to families um, or proactively communicate about potential changes. Um, but uh, at this point, I think uh, we're going to we're going to um, focus on the the task at hand in eligibility determination and be in close contact about things as as we know more and as we really embark upon this. Thanks, Ann. Um, and then a question about, so new, um, new st brand new staff will be attending the training. Will there be a general preschool promise orientation as part of the training, or do we need to handle that separately? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the manual includes a program overview, and I think because we'll be talking about, particularly about eligibility, um, that will include kind of the, the overview of um, eligible uh, eligibility criteria. Um, and so in that case, I think there'll be some um, some talk about a general um, preschool promise, but um, I think the manual will be, will be the a good source of information as well. Super, excellent. And then of course, you know, Dana and Ann and Andy and I are all available for um, specific technical assistance um, for folks as well and to answer questions. Um, and so there's another one about um, should everyone on a team participate on the same training or is it better for them to attend different sessions or does it matter? 
It's going to be the same uh, training. So um, I think if uh, availability, if it's something you want to be able to take back and reflect on together, then um, share, you know, I would leave it up to you all to decide um, what works best, but there's no requirement that everybody participate in one or attend different ones. Yeah, and then here's a, just a question comment about the, that week being a big vacation time. So will the, the trainings be um, recorded for people to look at later? Yep, recorded and I think um, potentially training some in the future as well. I think we, yeah, summertime is of course um, big difficult time to try to uh, pin folks down, but I think um, I think we want to be flexible and make sure that everyone feels prepared to start. Yep. Yep. Um, let's see here. Will preschool promise providers be able to offer hybrid and distance learning options? I'm not sure we know any of this yet. If so, will the coordinated enrollment guidance training include placement prioritization guidance? For working families needing on-site only care, that's a big loaded question. <laughs> I can say that we'll talk about, I think, um, the prioritization of families' choices about what care they need. That will be part of the training. Um, but the the first part of the question, I don't know that I have the answer to. This is Diana. Great question, and we're going to go ahead and add off on answering that question because. Uh, that is connected to also like the revisions and stuff. So uh, we'll go ahead and write that down. And that has been a question that has come up. So definitely refer to the FAQ. Uh, our message has been is that as grantees are having that question, you know, as they're getting ready to go ahead and sign their contract, is that we know that we need to go ahead and provide the guidance um, based on the current situation and what does preschool promise look like. So um, don't quite have an answer for that because everything's still still moving along okay and then here's a question about if head if a head start program already has families i would assume that are eligible for all of their preschool promise slots then what happens um they would i believe be considered um in the head starts enrollment processes um you know, for those that uh, fill the spaces, they would they would be essentially converted or, or enrolled in Preschool Promise. I'm not sure if there's more more uh, to that question uh, that I could address. Did that answer, Annette? You're good. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, more to come, I'm sure, on that um, piece. So let's see. Here's one. The manual is the same as the toolkit. Is that correct? And if so, is the goal to have that out prior to the training by a day or so? I think we I think we said yes to that. Correct. Yes. I think the the distinction just to to note is I think we we have a a plan for. Um, a separate but related uh, outreach, uh, specifically some some templates uh, that we are we have been calling the outreach toolkit. But um, the primary uh, focus of this training and what will be available um, will be the manual. Gotcha. Good, good, good. Um, let's see here. All right, and then uh, so I, I've gotten. I see there's a couple questions here that are specific to hub situations, which we can take offline. Um, with each of you, so um, I have I have captured those and we'll be in touch um, with a couple of folks here. So feel free, of course, that's what we're here for is your technical assistance, because um, we know there are some things that are just in your region. Mm -hmm. All right. Any, so I think I got through all the, <laughs> through the chat box. Did I miss anybody? If I missed you and you want me to find your question, wave your hand. Or you could speak now, Beth. Oh, are you pointing at yourself or something? Else? I was just—I had one more um, chat box question, but basically, just wondering if you could restate the enrollment deadline. Is it still September 30, or there will be flexibility with that, or sort of what are we aiming to get all all kiddos in the door? Dana, do you want to address that? Uh, we don't have an answer to that right now. We know that we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, one thing that that we do know 
internally would be that we want to go ahead and align some of our programming so it goes beyond just preschool promise we'll need to go ahead and you know so go ahead and provide some of that guidance to our lpk publicly funded programs so more to come on that thank you dana go ahead lisa yeah and you maybe said this as you're reading through the chats and i apologize if i missed it I was uh, had a request in there uh, to see if we could get a copy of the language that will be included in the contracts regarding the hub role and the CCR and R role and the intersection of those relationships. If we could get a copy of that. Not until it's provided to the actual people who are receiving the grants, Lisa. Absolutely. So Absolutely. when we after we issue those uh, agreements for people to review and determine if they're going to sign we can also make that language available to you great thank you so much yeah this is begonia do we have any news about changes changes on the group size because that's the number one question that providers are asking us yeah begonia i was uh, talking a little bit earlier about this a lot of those questions around uh the the regulations or the um the changes therefore we'll know more in august um but uh, at this point we don't have any more information about that i i do need to um, amend uh, only slightly what ann said she is correct they will not be finalized till the end of till the middle of august august 14th but thursday morning um we will be posting on our website a discussion draft of the guidance, uh, which reflects the revisions that um, the Early Learning Division um, has vetted with OHA, um, has shared with the HELC, um, and um, also will be uh, talking again today with the HELC about proposed revisions. Um, and they will be posted on our website from Thursday morning through Sunday evening. So it's an opportunity for um, comment uh, on those. And um, so, uh, and also, as I said, the HELC is meeting today, the uh, Healthy Early Learners Council that's advising the governor. So um, there may also be information that HELC members choose to share, but in terms of what we are making available for public comment, we'll be posting that on Thursday so that we can post the Spanish translation and the English at the same time on our website. So opportunity for you all to see what's being proposed related to guidance, um, which I think will um, illuminate many of your wonderings about what next what the program year might look like ah, other questions okay all right so now we have time for just in time with the agenda perfect open forum which I know we've been kind of in an open forum anyway, but um, are there other pe things that people want to um, discuss or talk about? Agenda items, updates, anything happening? Exciting? Uh, this is Molly uh, up in Multnomah. We just uh, were in front of the Board of County Commissioners today to answer questions about um, our universal preschool measure that's going to the ballot in November, and it looks really promising. The, yep, the board will make a recommendation on the 30th to put it on the ballot, which we are pretty confident they will do. And the last round of polling showed um, a 70% approval rate amongst voters. So we are pretty excited about the potential to bring um, significantly increased public funded preschool to Multnomah County. So a lot of hard work by our parent leaders. And um, anyway, we're on our way. That is awesome. Congratulations, Molly. So if the ballot measure passes in November, when would that potentially affect like en enrollments in January or how soon would things get started? Uh, we have, a, we're looking at a planning year. We've been doing a lot of implementation planning, but um, 
Well, then that first year we will be primarily coordinating other publicly funded preschool work into this countywide system so that the first new additional slots would open then in 21. And we expect if everything goes well, according to our plan, we will be at um, have spots for all 7,000 children in seven years. So that's the hope. That's so cool, Molly. Where where is the funding source coming on that? It's a it's a complicated um, income to our tax measure based on uh, income status. So okay. it's uh it's like I think it's 1.5 on households double filing households of 200,000 or more, and then it um, anyway it bumps up as it goes up. But that's the mechanism that's tested well and um, gives us what we need. So. That's yeah, it's, 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 wow. it's remarkable to me that the voters are willing to, um, in the middle of this economic difficulty, um, to take it on and to take it on so enthusiastically. So, yep. yeah, yep, yep. Well, the silver lining is people have a new uh, appreciation for the importance <laughs> of having your children in a high quality place during the day while yes. you're out trying to do your job, right? Yes, I think the business, you know, as we've worked over the years with the business community to bring them on board, they definitely made a, uh, a turn in the right direction during the pandemic. So yeah, it's very visible to everyone. Yes. Yeah, well, good work. That's very exciting. We look forward to hearing hearing more and uh, all of our fingers are crossed for November for your um, uh, for that ballot measure. So Thank other you. other other things you want to discuss. I love the celebrations piece too. It just floats my boat, you know, so anybody want to celebrate something exciting in your community as well? I don't have a celebration, but I do have a question for folks around the state. Um, I'm getting a lot yeah. of questions from my K-12 partners about um, school-aged childcare, uh, especially for districts that are doing a hybrid model and the parents don't know what to do with their kids on their days that they're supposed to be home, distance learning, and the parents are back at a work site. Um, and in combination with that, um, is there anybody so curious about any solutions that are coming up around that and then sort of tangentially is anybody exploring um, partnering t um, student teachers that are trying to get practicum hours with childcare uh, for school aged kids as a way for them to finish their degrees. Mm. Does anyone want to take that on. Uh, this is Evan. I don't. I don't have an answer for that. I just would second the. Uh, I would be nice to know what's going on. What conversations are happening around school aged care? Because it's there's a lot of them happening locally. And you know what I've been talking to people about is that it's probably it's partially an advocacy piece and partially some local response. And so I'm curious if anybody from the division has had heard any conversations about possible state level responses, either funding or anything else that may go towards provision of school age care. I mean, because the big thing I've, aside from just the size of the need, the district, when the districts talk about it, it's also almost like a, t a different type of care because they're right. talking about the need to have <laughs> intensive tutoring services for kids who are not, or whose parents are at work, right? Because right. The, the model demands uh, if you're at home, some level of of adult interaction, particularly for younger children. And I'm hearing a lot of higher income families hiring private tutors and hiring um, online services that they their kids can access. But um, of course, our low income families and um, non English speaking families um, are are at a distinct disadvantage with that. This is Krista and. Um, but one of our really small school districts is trying to figure out a way to, I'm in touch with both our R&R &R folks about this and also um, ESD superintendents because they're working so closely with school districts on the plans. And there's a guidance document out there and it has some specific language about coordinating and working both with early learning and other community partners. So I've just been trying to stay tuned to what that looks like. 
um, some districts are trying to figure it out on their own and coming up with some innovative and creative strategies. But um, we're, um, I suspect in the next, I think on the 7th of August, we might be having a community-wide conversation that includes economic development. We've been trying to raise the conversation to that level to say, um, are there, um, larger employers or other folks who might have a vested interest in thinking about how this can work. I think, I always think to Brenda Comini and the work that they've been doing in Central Oregon around this, because I think um, there's something there and I'm trying to explore models. Um, but Evan's question to the ELD about, you know, the bigger picture and how it's all going, I just, um, that's just what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Krista. John, is there a place where we can direct people to that where the ongoing conversation is about what's going to happen with K-12 and school-aged? I, I would direct people to ODE mm -hmm. and there, bring their Everybody questions can... there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit out of our purview specifically, but it's yeah, it's a, certainly something I think that's on everyone's minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there, is there a specific? Sorry, Evan, is there a specific place in ODE we should go to for that? I, I it feels like a behemoth. I'm not sure where to go. Yeah, I'm, have you have you been looking at the K-12 guidance that's out? Yeah, I would guess in there there must be. I mean. I know on page 47, it talks is the citation that Krista is citing because uh, okay. I've been looking at that. Um, but I believe in there, there is a place to submit and like it gives a like an email address or something to submit questions like that's okay. how I would pursue it if I was you. Thanks. I, that's the other, I mean, the other people. Go ahead. Sorry, Evan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm Go talking ahead, to districts like I've met with the ESD and the superintendent of ESD and um as well as i had some conversations with portland public staff are working on it and i think the issue is that it's a tw it's an issue that lies between multiple jurisdictions and so mm -hmm. it's kind of this thing that it doesn't feel like it has a home right now because you have issues around licensing and capacity for school age care which some young some early childhood providers also provide school age care either before or after the school day and then you have this component of you know, the additional demands on child care capacity in terms of a sector is is already kind of down and you're potentially adding a whole ton of additional kids into it. So that's kind of like the early childhood component. And then you have the T-12 in terms of trying to meet their curriculum demands. And so it it's sitting between both. Um, and what I've had, the conversation that I've had is to ask people to bring it up with COSA and to also talk to the unions about it. Because the fact is, if they can't, get child care for their employees like that's kind of the prime mover that's where a lot of the conversation started if they don't have care for their employees then they're not they're not going to have teachers which then leads down a whole other path and so um you know i've worked with our county commission to flag it for the governor's office for them to consider it um, but it does feel like you know nobody's been able to tell me out of everybody i've talked to this is the specific place where this conversation is living and i think that's a bit of a problem if if nobody knows where this conversation is happening. Well, I think it's complicated by the fact, Evan, that uh, regulated child care, like your typical homes and centers that do school age care, make their own business decisions about what kind of contract they establish with parents about expectations for what they'll do for the children when they're in their care. So that's that's a very personal business decision um you know then there are the typical providers that we would see for after school care right and they have a typical way that they operate i mean obviously people are challenged by the fact that we're in a pandemic where the terms before and after school care just are turned on their head so uh, I think you're correct that in general, people don't have to have this conversation because schools provide childcare. As a, it, it, I mean, we don't call it that, but they provide a place for children to go on a five day a week basis that matches reasonably well with a lot of people's working hours. So 
the fact that they're changing their model in response to the pandemic, I mean, it's a relatively, I guess, unsurprising that we would discover these gaps. I feel like that's been just a part of this whole pandemic is a revelation of the things that we haven't understood we need to be talk talking and focusing on. Um, but clearly, if there's a required educational component or a desire to have an educational component, like getting that to be in place is a lot of different kind of conversations. Um, because certainly what we've heard from what we've heard from people that were just trying to providers that were just trying to support folks at the end of the school year when we were all in lockdown mode was very challenging expectations of of parents thinking that somehow providers would be able to do schoolwork with children, especially when people are caring for 16 children or 10 children and there's one adult. So um, I think it's important to be having these conversations and it isn't, it isn't anyone's specific responsibility, whether or not it should be. Um, I think this, this conversation that's starting across the state, I mean, there'll be, interesting to see what happens. Um, but these private childcare businesses have to make business decisions and we're going to have to respect that. Like we are very careful about that. Uh, I agree with all that. I think it's just as a hub who's connected to a lot of different things like Beth talked about, we're just kind of in the middle of some of this yeah. and people are looking to us to go where, where to, you know, what do we do? Yeah. And you can only bootstrap a solution so much. And so it's also a question of, what's the correct channel to elevate the conversation and that i think that's what we're struggling with right now yeah i mean i think some of this is about what does school mean you know if people want children to be doing school work what's the school's responsibility for supporting that school work to happen and i'm not deliberately trying to be provocative i'm just saying we have an idea about school that it either happens in this way or it happens in that way. And I think what this conversation is saying is like, we actually might need some schooling to happen in some different environments that we're not used to, like who's responsible for paying for that? How do we make that happen? And I think that may be very emergent because I'm not sure that we have the, like you're suggesting, we don't necessarily have the pathways we need to answer those. It's not a technical problem right? We don't have an easy solution. It's an adaptive problem that we have to create solutions for. I really like how you said that, Joan. The reason I was smiling when you said that, it's like, go big or go home. What is school? You know, like that's, it's so, it's so interesting to frame it in a different way about an adaptive, you know, problem and then an adaptive solution. Um, I've been thinking about partners who are kind of already a little bit adaptive, like, OSU Extension or um, Parks and Rec or other folks who are kind of used to doing that co-mingling STEM hubs, that co-mingling work of kind of keeping kids occupied while also like keeping a component of some kind of not formal instruction, but learning opportunities um, that are structured and guided. And I'm really, I think, I, I mean, I don't know what it, if it helps, but I really am thinking about child care resource and referral, economic development folks through regional solutions, and partnering with those guys to host a broader conversation and inviting some of those other people to the table um, to think about how how we do this. And I don't, it's I, overwhelming. I, I mean, me. yes. Yes, and that's the thing. It's overwhelming, to, obviously, because of the scale of it. Um, and I think we're trying to have localized conversations that to a degree, but we're also identifying things that are that people are running into difficulties with. Like an example, some of the districts like, OK, well, let's let's talk about what we need to do. Uh, we don't logistically don't have the space to provide care, even if we wanted to. So can we get some more spaces allocated to do this? And it's like, well, we can't license new facilities right now. And so oh. that's that's an oh. obstacle, you know, or right. that's what people are saying, or uh, where how would we even go about funding and creating subsidized funding pools? Um, and so it's like that's I think that yeah. people want to respond, yeah. but people also have yeah. to know that there's a the money is everything costs, right? You can't just snap your fingers and make something happen. I think that's where this is starting to go, which is like, is it an ask? Is it a budgetary ask on the state level? Sure. Uh, I don't know. Sure. 
Yeah. I mean, it's part of the how should schools be designed right now? How should education be designed in some ways? Um, I do want to say, because that reminded me, um, your, your point about licensure, that the Office of Child Care is going to start to uh, remotely license new facilities. Um, that's getting back online. Um, and I'm sure more information will be available for that. Um, in, and then um, has the intention of moving to a hybrid licensure process once they are able to get full access to PPE so that they can go um, on site safely, um, but we'll be starting to move people through the queue um, who need and have been waiting to be licensed. So that's going to be starting up, um, I think, as early as uh, next week. This is Jillian. I just wondered where family, friends, and neighbors fit in, and I've had faith-based organizations um, asking about that and asking about um, what the possibility is that they can help too. So just thought I'd bring that up. Mm -hmm. Other good discussion, other points of discussion we want to get into at 2.12. All right, so um, what's going to happen next is I will put together invite for a go-to meeting for um, one week from today, 1.30 to 2.30, 28th of July for folks who's a prerequisite to the eligibility training. They'll start on the 29th and go through August 6th into our increments. And Anne, I think you or I will send out that um, to everybody. So um, you can go ahead and just have folks uh, sign up um, sign up there um, as well. And if you have questions or troubles, just let Ann and I know. We can get you um, all set up in that. And then ELC meeting on the 30th. Um, and as Joan mentioned, some um, good information coming out on Thursday regarding um, some of the guidance pieces um, as well. So with that, we will give you a whole 17 minutes of your day. Go out and get some, stretch your legs before the 90 degree weather hits um, or sit in front of the air conditioner and just enjoy your extra time today. And uh, we'll be glad to be with you again next Tuesday, everybody. So have a great week. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.